as I understand the, the system, the financing system here is somewhat very different from what we have in Portugal. And um, in Portugal we have a very specific author driven financing. So I would say that that's why we have so many radical directors, radical authors. And, um, and basically we, will, we are still being able or fighting against the normality of the whole Europe, of whole Europe which is uh, having more commercial films, more established films. And we've been able to, to keep our fight. Uh, I did four feature films already and one is in Super 8. All the rest is uh, digital. But my short films, I like to shoot and experiment on different formats. So another film we have here is a film that I did recently on um, that was shot on 35. They're all very simple. None of them has any dialogues, um, and of course that's more of an aesthetic um, option or an experimental option of doing films differently than my feature films. So my short films are different. Feature films, and of course, it has to do with my with my daily job, which is being a producer, which is uh, contracts, Excel sheets, and a lot of uh, bureaucracy. And so, my films are quite free, and I really don't prepare my films that well. I don't uh, usually I don't write scripts at all. Sometimes not even for feature films. And I really feel that I have to go free and open-minded to shoot and feel free. Of course, being a producer, uh, that helps, of course. I wouldn't like to have more directors like me in my company. But this way, this schizophrenic relationship between me as a producer and me as a director, it's easier this way. And so, so I make films and mostly I make short films uh, <laughs> To feel free and to do whatever I want. So these films are that kind of films. Somehow, sometimes they have something to say. The political status in Portugal. So, um, as a filmmaker, uh, I felt that uh, we had to say something about that also. But, uh, but mainly, my feature films are more political. If you want, my short films are still more free, even in that sense. In Ukraine, it's impossible to get money on crazy experimental films without a script and how did you manage to do it? And also about the sound, because the sound was only recorded, environmental sound on the system recorded and then was produced afterwards for the sound after the shooting. So, um, for this film I had no money. And I, said, I had just finished a feature film that was a really crazy project and that was very difficult to finish, so I was in the need of making a fast film where I could go with my friends and have fun somewhere in the middle of nowhere and make a film that I really didn't know exactly what, except that we were facing right to begin, this is right in the beginning of the economic crisis in Portugal um, and where we were starting to have the, the biggest uh, uh, migration process from Portugal um, since the late 60s, uh, when we were on, on the edge of... We had a dictatorship till 1974 in Portugal. And so in the late 60s, uh, millions of Portuguese just uh, flew away to Germany, to France, to whatever, to several European countries, mostly to European countries. And, uh, and since this uh, crisis, crisis, this uh, bankster crazy gang, uh, crisis began, Portugal was facing a new, uh, a new process of migration. And so this film is, of course, about that and about uh, this reality, which is a crazy reality that uh, the Portuguese people don't know about, which is this is the biggest uh, underground mine in all Europe. It's in, it's in between two mountains, next to the border of Spain, and it's all tunnels together are 14,000 kilometers. So we could come underground from Portugal to Kiev, 
just around this mine, which is underground mountains. And these mountains that I shot are not mountains, are the rejects of the inside of the mine. So this is what they are throwing away. They create these gigantic mountains into the into the river. So the river was highly polluted. Theoretically, when we went there, there was no more pollution. They told us there were fish. Now you can shoot inside the river, no problem. And we were using uh, real miners in the film. And when they knew we were all, all the crew was inside the river, they said, oh, you guys are crazy. Because the river is really polluted. And that's going to be a big problem. But the DOP had a skin problem, and he lost that skin problem still today. So it was a good process, even for him. And we are still very good friends, and we still work together. So it was OK. Um, so concerning financing, I didn't have any money to make this film. So what I decided to do back then, I did a lot of uh, video clips for uh, bands. I come from music. So I started as a musician, my profession was early, by the age of 16. And I lived as a musician until I was 20 or something. And uh, so most of these nowadays famous musicians, I used to play with them. And so there's a lot of music in my films because they are my friends. Now they are famous, but back then not really. And, um, and so, I got, I got uh, 3,000 euros to make a video clip. So, make a video clip to that guy whose name is uh, Sean Riley. It's a guy who appears playing guitar on a bar. And I just shot one roll of film. Uh, so I just shot three and a half minutes of film for the video clip. And the rest I spent on the film, of course. <laughs> and so those 3,000 euros were enough for um, film and developing. So I spent the whole 3,000 euros in the lab. And uh, it was mostly shot on one-to-one, -one, the film. So I think we, there's one shot we did three takes, but that was only one. Because we had no film, so I was OK with that. And, and then sound. We, did sound. we did local sound just one day. So we just recorded steps and the river and the sound of the machines and all of that, and the documentary style of the machines. Ah, because what I was saying and I forgot is that I wanted to show this uh, because Portugal is a um, very, very clean country. Clean in the sense of, uh, I would say, very secure on working matters. You know, it's very European on that sense. And but this is still nowadays. It exists nowadays. That's why nobody can get in, and it's very, very hidden because this is weird. For me, it looks like. We are in, back in the 30s. So when I went there, and the, and the population of that village is really, really, really lost. Because they have to drive like 40 minutes to get to somewhere. So when I, when I went there on a, on a scouting for a fiction film by, by F. G. Ossan, the, the, the French director, who is a very old friend of mine, and I, and I was scouting around Portugal to show him some spots for his film. And then, uh, so he, he said that he didn't want to shoot here, and I said, great, I'll make a film here myself. And uh, so I asked some help, some local help, so production-wise, I got the camera was free, lights I got them for free, the crew for free, the food and sleeping, the local uh, municipality paid for that, so they had this they had this. Um, they, they were they were investing on this uh, mine tourism kind of thing, so that people would go. Never worked, but they had this brand new place to put people to sleep in, so they liked it instead, and they paid for the meals, uh, and that's it. And then I had six hours to edit this film because I had a free steam bag for six hours, so I decided I would edit it in six hours only. And that's it. And then, curiously enough, the film is this crazy thing. And curiously enough, it was, I don't know, like over 80 or 90 film festivals. And I won like 10 international awards. And it was crazy. For me, it was great. I have to be honest, this was the, the best decision I made. This made me make a lot of 
morphemes. So let's do that. Go ahead. Uh, how did you manage to get to use uh, the tape, not digital format, but the tape? 8 or 16? 16 millimeters. 16. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I'm asking because it's like expensive enough, or would have to know someone. No, well, I bought, no, I bought the film with those 3,000 euros I had. That's the money I used, I used oh, to buy, yeah. buying the film and developing the film. So it was all spent in the lab. They did me a big discount because it was a new lab. Uh, they were, they were hand-developed in this. So as you can see, there's a lot of defects on the film. But I wanted that. I knew that would happen. So dirt and uh, developing problems and stuff. So it was cheap, but so still, I paid the lab and the film. Free. Camera, yeah, it was an old camera. We couldn't even see it. I didn't know. We were <laughs> to watch the viewfinder, I was like, okay, this side, this side, this side, this side. Okay, okay. So sometimes I thought in the shot there was the top of the mountain, and when I see it here, I say, oh shit, there's no top of the mountain. So, well, uh, conditions we have. There was this bad, uh, this band who wanted me to make a video clip for them. It was bad music, so I, I always say no. And says, so okay, but I'll produce that video clip. I won't direct it, but I produce it. And uh, so I called this, this crew who went with me. They would go for free anyway. But I said, okay, so I'll get you a job, everybody, for two days, and I'll pay you those two days, and then you come with me for four days into the mountains. So, so we did on the two days before we shooting this, we were shooting a video. So I could, so. People got paid for two days' job. But they would prefer not to get paid and not do the video clip anyway. I found out that later on. But uh, at least I tried to pay them something. But what I've been in. Uh, go ahead. Just for the music, you know, the musicians, so yeah. they, they gave the music for free. Yeah. Then they composed this music for the film. But uh, yes, so they, they composed it on purpose for the film, but they did it for free. Yeah. The studio was for free. The studio recorded this studio for free. So. The music is really unique because it's not like classical music, it's more especially. Yes, done. for the film. Yeah. So Portuguese uh, author society, you know, I don't know if you understand what I mean. So this organization takes care of authorship uh, rights. They charge me more. Um, even if they want to give me a music for free from a previous record, even my friends, I have to pay to the Portuguese Author Society. So it's always cheaper for me to have new music made on purpose than to buy old music, even if the authors say it's for free. So it's a crazy system, but so I'd rather have always original music, and then we release the records afterwards, and everybody's happy, and, and we have fun, and that's important. So. Making films is an extreme hard thing, so it's very important that you have fun. Did you edit by yourself? This one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had an editor, a friend of mine, but then he was he was with me on the editing, so he's credited as the editor, but he was so scared of editing on fast forward on a steam bag that it was me doing my <laughs> you know, and so he was like just sweating, but like oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Yeah, it was a bit crazy when you see it, I know there are some mistakes I'd, if I had time to do, but, uh, but yes, I had an editor uh, with me, but then I usually, my short films I edit myself, usually with my feature films I always have an editor, so somebody outside to have a different perspective, a different point of view, which I think is very important, even in short films, I think it's very important that somebody else comes in, as a producer, I try always to push an editor into the film, so somebody else gives a, a new perspective, a new point of view. Somebody that was not in the shooting is usually something I consider important, because it's something that didn't suffer to make this very specific shot and knew that the actress was naked for four hours on a freezing day. She just looks at it and says, well, I'm sorry, it looks like shit, it's not. So, and I think that's very important to have somebody clear-minded, not coming from the shooting, but coming just sitting down and watching it for the first time. 
So as a producer, yeah. Yeah. I think it's very important to have an idea. And it's a film about the attraction of your homeland somehow. So it's the attraction. So the, that's why the sound is so important. I think the sound of the, the sound that you hear from the mountain is the it's a crazy sound because it's this bass like it's always there and you can see it from that uh, from the mountain entrances so where we see in the beginning man going down coming up and on. the sound that comes out from that mouth of the mountain is crazy because it's this bass constant bass and it's very and it's very intriguing because of course they get used to it you know, because their brain just and uh, uh, how do you say uh, Kills those frequencies, right? Uh, kills not the right word, but you know what I mean. But when you go out and you go there, it's really strange. It looks like there's some beast there. Like, what the fuck is this? You know, so like, and people go in and people come out and people go out. So I, I could never shoot inside the mine because there was no film. It's a 100 uh, ASA, so film, stop. So it's not possible. I would have to carry. At least a couple of two Ks to, to shoot in seven months. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you said you had no script, like in classical no. meaning. You give the, you, you this I had, I, had, I had a script with very, very small lines. So, okay, it's not really the film, but I had a script, small lines, where like this happens, and then I had a, a a picture of a machine, and then I said, then she goes somewhere, and I had another picture of this, the documentary machines around. So I had a script with one line, one photo, one line, one photo, one line, one photo. So every action, there was a line. Every machine I wanted to put, there was a picture of the machine itself. Because when I went there, I had a camera, of course, we were scouting, so, so I took pictures. So there is kind of script. Many, but even in, no. So storyboards, I don't do storyboards because sometimes I may have to explain something to a crew, like, okay, we're setting this, so I draw um, a map, like a bird's eye map, and say, okay, point one here, point two here, point three here, and I'm okay. So everybody understands if there's a movie, say, okay, from here to here, <coughs> this movie, uh, we're shooting this shot first, this traveling first, and this one, so all the crew understands what's going to happen for the next six or eight hours. So sometimes I do that and I say, okay, so we will start on a close-up this way, but usually, usually I don't need to draw anything, people understand what I'm talking about. And I, the, the, to be honest, is, um, I don't like to talk much in, uh, while shooting, so I use mainly the same people all the time. And so that, that's very good. People know what I want and I don't need to talk much and I can focus on the actors and feel free, and I just say, okay, so we should be here, and I leave. Uh, have you ever considered it as an option to shoot a commercial? Not really. Not really. I did one commercial in my life, mm -hmm. only one. I shot uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, I shot him dancing, actually. Uh, and I did it, uh, and I did it only because it was friends of mine who, who are associated with him, and they, know, they came to me saying, we know you don't want to do this, but please listen to us till the end. You like to be more free? Uh, like no, totally. To I think that, to be honest, it's like that if I, if I ever stopped doing cinema, I wouldn't be able to do as many films as I do, as a producer, as a director, as everything. So I kept my focus, even when I didn't have any money to eat or to pay my rent. Or... But on the other side, commercials bring more money. Of course. But then you lose focus. Okay. So I did one commercial in my life. I had this gigantic fight with everybody. I did one TV film once. I had a gigantic fight with everybody. It's always it always drawing in, me into violence. So I'm more of a peaceful guy, as you can see in my films. So if I go that way, it's going to get me too nervous. Because I don't, I don't like people, you know. No, but you can sit down. Yeah. But I don't, you know, I don't like people around and saying what to do and telling me what to do. Or, I think that's just, but I understand, of course, that you have to make choices in your life. And what I know is that once you go on one side to come back, ooh, I have a lot of, a lot of uh, commercial directors 
my friends had come to me and said, I really need you to produce a film, I really, you know, but and I always go and have lunch with them, and got, but it takes forever for them to live that life and be really ready to jump to the other side. While most of the people I work with, none of them is rich, I can assure you that. Most of my daily job is guaranteeing that they're okay, their families are okay, that they're able to pay their rents and everything. So I produce a lot more films than I should, but at least I can, all my friends are okay, they survive, which is good. Um, and most of the times it's because, it's exactly because of that, otherwise they have to jump to the other side. And that will be a problem. You know? And um, so even video clips, you know, I did video clips mostly for free, mostly for friends. Because all of the guys who have money, their music sounds like shit. So you have to, it's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult decision, but you really have to make it. It's like if you start making video clips for shitty bands, ah, it's a tough decision to come back again, you know? You mean you're losing the taste, uh, the eye? Yeah. What? No, you're losing, you're losing control of, to make the decision of what you really want. So you're losing your independence. So you can never fight back after that. I just did a, I did one video clip just to let you know. To, uh, I did one video clip on the peak of the corruption in Portugal. I did one video clip of this very important charismatic band that's on the so 31st anniversary now. So they were their 30th anniversary was last year. So it's that old band, and they did this radical. They do this, uh, but they're very well-known in Portugal. They sing in Portuguese, so it's not one of, those, one of these friends of mine that play all around the world. It's a very specific band, they're very old. And they did this very radical, politically uh, record. And so I decided to make this video where we shot the president, the prime minister, the owners of the whole banks of Portugal. The guys were going to jail, and it was a mess. You, you know, it was like, that's how you, but, Despite all the newspapers tried to crash me because of this small video clip for a rock and roll band, it's impossible because I am free. You know, and that is a very important state of mind, which is I can say whatever I want, whenever I want. In my meetings with the culture minister, with the president of the film institute, I can say whatever I want because at least they know sometimes I'm a bit rough, but at least I'm always honest with them. And sometimes honesty is a difficult thing for a politician, but but it's important, so you know. So I decide not to make commercial video clips and make a radical video clip where I knew that the news, uh, you know, it was like every newspaper, uh, the night news on television were like, these guys are going crazy, you know. But it's it was important at the same time because it created a, a very a very big reaction. So on the, on the feature film I did right before this film, so like three or four years before was the previous film I did, was a Western based on civil disobedience by Henry David Thoreau. So the base of uh, anarchism, the, the Bible of anarchism, if you want. And I released the film in Portugal before the film was over, before I finished the feature film. And uh, it was done because it was uh, election, so the government fell, a new government was coming. And so this way, I could make a new film and insult everybody because I was, you know, I was going to go back on TV to give interviews to newspapers and everything. So it was a political engaged film and this way I could kick everybody I want. And it worked, you know, because I think that that's also important that uh, what you make is not... Well, my new film... It started as a crime film and it has a love film, so being free also has its problems. Sometimes you are more mellow, sometimes you are more radical. But at least it gives me that freedom. And, um, and that's it. So, but I, this is no rule. This is my way. Every, everybody, probably some other people can manage better. I know I can't, so I decided not to. You know, and even, even TV, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough because you're getting into trouble. I'm getting into trouble. Uh, uh, whom do you prefer to produce? Uh, Old guys. 
Well, both well, galleries. Not only your previous. Uh, no, no, I've galleries. produced. I've produced Aki Kaurismaki, for example, which is a very good friend of mine. I have produced a film by Peter Greenaway. I have produced Jean-Luc Godard. I have produced Oliveira, of course, the old Oliveira. I have produced several people that I like very much. And the old guys are the easy ones. The young guys are the tough. No, old guys listen. Young guys listen. Don't you? Yeah. You know, me and Aki, I sit down with him. We are together several times, many times. And we sit down and I say, what about this? And he goes, yeah, good idea. You know, it's, it, it, doesn't feel, it doesn't feel I'm interfering on his film. It's always his film. It's not my film. The younger directors are always more eager to protect their child. But Oliveira always said, well, you know, my best film is my next film. <laughs> and he just did like 50 films, right? So he said, oh, my best film is my next film. I said, okay, that's good. So you always feel like this one has passed and you're focused on the next one. So it's, it's also interesting. Our 100 and... Uh, his last film he shot, uh, he was 105. Right. So that's something. They say yes, they come, and sometimes they don't even know a clue what they're going to do. And you know, but like famous actors, and they just go, and they know it's going to be okay, it's going to be fun, they're okay, and they go, and then sometimes I give them lines while we are shooting. And sometimes I go, no, you're not that guy, you're another guy. Kill, kill that character, let's create a new character. While we are shooting, and you understand that things you thought sometimes doesn't work with that actor and everything. So I don't feel too stuck to that, you know. Uh, uh, of course, I worked for several years as an assistant director, so, and as a producer, so, uh, you know, so everything is okay. We have, uh, we have uh, shooting, uh, how do you say, shooting maps, so very clear, very perfect. We respect shooting hours, we respect lunch time, very important, and you know, and, and I make a map saying, okay, so I'll have these three actors on this set for six hours. And then, you know, we go and we see what's going to happen. Sometimes I have no clue, and they don't have any clue what's going to happen, but they go anyway. And sometimes the film keeps changing. Sometimes I feel, I feel in love with a character, and I kill some character out of the film. Of course, most of the films where there's a lot of money, where there's a lot of co-producers, a lot of international co-producers, this cannot work. Right, so there's a lot of pressure. You have to show, uh, you have to show everything you are doing to three or four uh, film institutes of different countries. Who I won't say this as openly as I'm saying here, of course. You know, so so films depend a lot. But concerning actors, I like to spend a lot more time with them before, thinking what character is that one, so they can be prepared for what any kind of improvise we are doing. You know, so mainly. I don't spend much time with them saying lines, ever. I don't, I don't even think of it. Except for my first feature film where I did the, the casting and stuff like that that I really hate. Not because I, I like to choose, I like to write thinking on who's playing that part. You know, when I think of a film, well, but I think of a film visually first. So the space is fundamental for me, so I know where I want to shoot. <coughs> then who's on frame and then if there is any narrative that's okay if we can find some narrative on this that is okay if not we'll find a way we will survive the medium has to be appropriate to what you want to say so the medium is very important for you to think about it. and if you have your own limitations saying I only have my phone so think a film that you can only film with your phone don't try to make a Hollywood flick with uh, your telephone because it will look like shit. So, just don't do it. So I would say that be in control of what you have. Even if you don't have anything, just make sure you know what you have and you're in control of that. But then the second part of the question is trickier. So, uh, just to answer to your first question is, any film, well, if you think that Pedro Costa just stopped shooting on mini DV, three years ago, right? and you think he's going official selection in Cannes with mini DV films or any other type, I'm talking about a, a friend of mine and not a, but there's a lot of people like this. So it has to do with what you are doing and the honesty you're doing. It has nothing to do with the, 
the number of pixels. A film has nothing to do with pixels or 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 grain or format or it has to do once you put it inside your own film. So then distribution and the exhibition of your film. It's a totally different issue. Uh, YouTube, well, showing things it's good. Uh, so I would say that the internet uh, or any kind of uh, television, VOD, DVDs, cinema, everything should be done. And you should do the most you can to show your film to the whole world. Uh, since you have something to say to the world, it's better if you can show it. Yet, I, there I'm a little bit more conservative, so I'm very worried to show my films in cinema. I do shoot for big format uh, and not to a film be seen on a telephone. So I don't think cinema can be seen on a telephone. And I don't think people see films on telephones or laptops or that is a different story. Well, I see films on laptops, of course, like everybody does. When I have to look at something, mainly when I'm processing or studying something, but not to enjoy it as a film goer. That I cannot do. That I have to be honest. That for that I go to the cinema. To a cinematic experience, I go to the cinema. And, and cinema is much more than telling stories or fairy tale stories or whatever. Cinema is much more than that. Cinema is a physical experience. And it's a, a spiritual, physical experience. It's not watching somebody talking to each other and saying stuff and, okay, now, okay, nice story. So I feel that for that you have to sit down on a dark room on a collective experience. So I'm a bit more conservative. I do feel that Aristotle on his poetics uh, killed script writing. So it was 2,500 years ago, everything has been written already. There's no inventiveness on cinema. Cinema is only point of view, personal points of view of people telling sometimes the same story, the same story, the same story again. And it's only different because it's told from you or for you or for, you know. So that's what matters. It's your point of view about something. All the rest. So answering to a question, that young man that is no longer there also. Uh, when I work with uh, young directors or in film school, I teach in film school, and my main goal is, okay, don't think you have this brilliant idea for a script, because usually it's a piece of shit. Just try to be honest, first of all, and try to be honest with yourself. And once you do that, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's much more important that you feel that you're doing what you feel you have to be doing than to, than to, you know, than to make people happy outside. Like, ah, what a nice moment. What a nice 90 minutes of my life I spent here. And in 90 minutes after, nobody even remembers what the hell they have seen 90 minutes before. So that is, I think cinema suffers from a hyper-realism uh, process that theater did not go to, but cinema started by the evolution of cinema and the history of cinema fleeting away from art uh, schools or art uh, currents or whatever the word is, and then just went into this hyper-realism of pretending to show, well, and it's, and it's, even if it's a very simple film of common people today, I don't think cinema is real, not, not even documentary. Documentary has nothing to do with reality. It's a big one. Documentary is a very specific point of view of a filmmaker to show whatever he wants from his own perspective and his own point of view. He's not showing reality to anybody. He's showing his point of view of reality to everybody. So reality does not exist in cinema. That is a big one. That's what newspaper people do, don't understand. Is once you choose where your camera is standing, you're making a radical decision of what you are showing and what you are keeping out of your frame. So there is no reality. There are points of view of that reality that either you want to convey and to communicate to others, or you don't. But once you start to lie to others saying you are showing reality, you're just lying. You are showing your point of view of that reality. Uh, what do you mean, uh, you said I started to a script 
No, because the Aristotle and his poetics just wrote all, all the possible formulas of the narrative construction. So since then, well, you know, Star Wars was written 2,500 years ago. You know what I mean? So even the structure has to do with all of the narrative history. So, you know, what I mean is we're not inventing anything. So one, uh, I had this uh, very interesting film teacher, a Norwegian crazy guy, a long time ago, that he, he asked on school, do you know why we watch so many black and white boring films? So you don't think you are inventing anything. So the thing is, watch a lot of films, because probably your ideas are there also. It doesn't mean you are copying. It means it's a process, a natural process. And it doesn't mean you have to be a radical Greenaway or our peer uh, director, you know. I'm not that kind of director. And I, but I'm okay with their uh, breaking through of language, right? I'm okay with that. I have no problem with that. But uh, I don't feel everybody has to be radical construction of new languages. Or I just feel people have to do what they have to. And making films, it's such, such, such a big work that you should all have fun while making them. Fun, friends. <laughs> and be happy in the end. <laughs>